Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have to come together as the family of God to worship you, to hear from your word, to be challenged and encouraged, to, to lay our needs and requests before you, and to fellowship together. And we just pray, Lord, for your hand of blessing upon this time. I pray, Lord, that whatever needs we may have come here with, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would meet us where we are, and you would even now begin the work that we need to see in our lives. We pray, Father, for, for those who uh, aren't with us or can't be with us, that you would watch over them, you would protect them, and um, we just ask for your blessing upon this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. passage taken straight from scripture where Jesus teaches us how we are to pray along these lines. So let's read these words together. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who owe us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For the past few weeks, with a break for Thanksgiving, we've been um, focusing on different parts of this prayer. As we, as we pray through it each week. And this week we're looking at that line, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, there's been a lot of debate over the years about what Jesus meant by this. I mean, why are we asking God not to lead us into temptation? Does that mean that God leads us into temptation? And, you know, is that fair? That, that's, this is something that theologians have been wrestling with and coming up with sort of different understandings of that phrase for some time. But I think what we... Can focus on in this sentence is what Jesus is assuming, what he's telling the apostles and us in their, in their shadow to take for granted, and that is the fact that God does lead us. 
When Jesus was calling his disciples over and over again, he just said, follow me. And he set an example for them of how to live and how to get it right and how to respond when people treat you badly. And the fact that he leads us gives us a responsibility. We have to watch where he's going. We have to listen for his instruction. We have to try to understand where he wants us to be as we go through our lives. And at some point, we need to take those first steps. We need to say, yes, I will follow. Where are we going? So we're going to sing a couple of songs this morning that, that focus on that idea of the fact that God leads us. Sometimes we can see him and we can see his feet on the path and we just walk because we know where we're going. Sometimes we have to listen for his voice. Where is he calling us from? And understand where we need to walk to find where he is waiting for us. Because wherever we're headed, he's already there. We're going to sing a couple of songs today. And I hope that uh, whether you sing these songs or just listen to them, that you will... Um, let those ideas sink into your mind and your heart and listen for what it is that God is saying to you about the ways that he's leading you and where he wants you.
taking first steps to follow Jesus. If you're somewhere down the road and feeling a little bit lost, wondering which way to turn, if you have been following him for years and years and you know how to hear his voice and how to trust him, where to turn. Today is the day to keep on that path. Today is the day to trust him. Today is the day to take that first step, to follow him hmm. as he leads you, to say yes to Jesus when he says follow me. Amen. I introduce to you Peter, Peter Belek, who's uh, Carol's brother. He's up visiting from the States and uh, plays the piano and sings. And so we've asked him to come and share a song with us. So Peter, it's all yours. I just pray that you would bless your word to our hearts as we look at it, that you bless this story, and that we would find inspiration in the lives of those who have, who have gone before. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. And take this time, it's yours, Lord. Do whatever you'd like with it, in Jesus' name, amen. I'll tell you a story, I, I told this before, so a couple might remember it. But um, if somebody was ever to ask me who your hero is that's not Jesus, I would say, well, my parents. Our, our seminary professor used to challenge us to find what he called dead mentors, people in history whose story would inspire us and teach us. And so I would say the Apostle Paul is a hero of mine. I just love his writings and the way he's able to explain deep truths. Uh, Billy Graham is a hero of mine just for the way he was able to 
take the gospel into the secular world, you know, and just be so comfortable in, in people who are non-believers in different settings. I know I go on YouTube sometimes and I'll watch him on The Tonight Show being interviewed by Johnny Carson or there's a, there's a classic interview where he's being interviewed by Woody Allen of all people. And he has this way of being able to engage and not turn people off but still present the gospel so clearly and it's like boy if if, if we could all do that um abraham lincoln who's a hero of mine um but also a baseball player named jackie robinson and i want to tell you the story about two men whose faith in god and in god's direction and in god's leading as we've been talking about and calling on their lives impacted all of society now, up until 1947, um, the, all baseball players, all major league baseball players had one thing in common. Well, maybe two things. <laughs> they were all men, but they were also all white. Black players were not allowed to play major league baseball up until 1947. They were kept out. There was no written rule. Whenever the owners of baseball teams were challenged on it, they said, well, there's no rule. They could come and play, but everybody knew that it wasn't going to happen. They had what was called a gentleman's agreement that they were going to keep African-American players out of baseball, just like they were kept out of many areas of society back in those days. In 1920, a group of black businessmen led by a guy named Rube Foster founded what it was called the Negro Leagues, which allowed African-American players to play baseball professionally and earn a living. But it wasn't the same. I mean, they, they had their own all-star game. Some of their stars made a lot of money, but, but it was separate and unequal. They, it was not the same as playing, not the same acclaim, the same fame, the same money as playing Major League Baseball. Some attempts were made, like some owners gave black players tryouts, but it was more to get the politicians off their back, you know, or the newspapers who would say, why aren't you letting black players play baseball? Okay, we'll give a tryout, but the, the tryouts never worked. Jackie Robinson had a tryout with the Boston Red Sox two years before the story I'm going to tell you happened, and it was it was just it was really just a show. There was a guy named Bill Veck who was a, a an owner in baseball for many years. He was a bit of a maverick. He just did whatever he wanted. And and in 1943, he decided that he was going to buy the last place Philadelphia Phillies, fire all the players on his team, and fill them all with black players from the Negro Leagues. Just have and take all the stars, black players. He would have won the World Series for many many years. But the other, he made the mistake of telling a newspaper man what he was planning to do, and the other owners found out, and they said to the commissioner of baseball, don't, don't you dare let Bill Veck buy the Phillies, and he didn't. So Jackie Robinson became, this is a story of two men, Jackie Robinson, who became the first African-American Major League Baseball player, and Branch Rickey, who was the general manager and part owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who brought Robinson into the Major Leagues. And these men, this is a story of two men, and their faith and their commitment, their dedication to following God's leading and obedience. Now, Wesley Branch Rickey was born in 1881, named Wesley after John Wesley, the famous 18th century evangelist. His parents were devout Christians, and Branch Rickey loved baseball. The only problem was he wasn't all that good at it. He made the major leagues. Uh, he batted 200 for a career. Those of you who know baseball, you know that's not very good, which means that he was successful in hitting the ball one of every five times at bat. The average player is successful one every four times. Star players are successful one every three times. For him, it was one every five times. And he was the catcher, but he didn't have a very good arm. So when he would try to throw to second base to catch someone stealing, the ball wouldn't quite make it there, and people were running on him at will. Um, and on top of all that, he refused to play on Sunday. He was a very strong Sabbath keeper, and he would not play baseball on Sunday. And so the managers are like, okay, you're not a good hitter, you're not a good thrower, and you're a part-time player. You don't show up on Sunday. So he, his career didn't last very long. So he left baseball and went to law school and decided to become a lawyer, but couldn't get sports out of his blood. And so when he went to Ohio Wesleyan University, he coached the sports teams there, including the baseball team. In 1904, his baseball team was going to South Bend, Indiana to play against the University of Notre Dame. And he, his star player was a catcher. And his name was Charles Thomas, and he was black. He was African-American. 
And so when the team showed up in South Bend, Indiana to, to register to the hotel, the, re the hotel clerk who was registering all the players except for Charles would not register Charles for the hotel. And Branch Rickey finally came to the counter and said, what's going on? What's wrong? Well, he can't stay here. And they had this big argument back and forth. And finally, Branch Rickey said, well, could you put a cot in my room? And he, and he could stay with me in a cot in my room. And the hotel manager reluctantly said, oh, OK, OK, that's fine. And so he told Charles, go on up to my room, get settled, and I'll be there in a minute. And when Branch Rickey went into the room, he saw Charles Thomas sitting on the edge of his cot, bawling and sobbing and rubbing his hands hard as possible. And he looked up at Branch Rickey with tears in his eyes and said, it's my black skin, Mr. Rickey. It won't come off. It won't come off. And Branch Rickey was heartbroken. And 40 years later in an interview, he decided, he said that it's a memory that he never forgot. And he felt that he needed to do something. He felt at that point he didn't do enough. But he felt that someday he wanted to do something to end this injustice, to change. He felt a calling, a divine pull on his heart to do something that lasted for 40 years that never left. And you know, we're all given something by God, something that tugs on our hearts, that God is pulling us and leading us to do that might be different from everybody else, and it will not let us go. It's always there. It's a passion that sometimes lies dormant, but then arises at various times in our lives. And just it never, ever goes away. It's a calling that God wants us to fulfill. You might even say it's our purpose. And when you do get involved in it, when you do that thing you felt like you were called for, you have this sense that, yeah, I'm doing what I was created for. It was a couple of things I did this week. You know, in ministry, not everything's perfect, and not everything is things that you really enjoy doing. You know, there's, there's routine in there, too, but there was a couple of times this week where it's like, yeah, this, this is what I was created to do, and it, you have that sense. And every one of us has that. And the question is, what is your calling? What is that one thing, that one gnawing in your heart that won't go away, that you, you just know that this is what God has put me on earth for. This is that one thing that God has created me for me to do. Maybe, maybe it's a few things. What's that one thing that he wants to work through you to impact people and make a difference in society, make a difference for the kingdom of God? So Branch Rickey continued in baseball, not as a player, but as a manager. He began to manage the last place, St. Louis Browns, one of the worst teams in baseball. They, if you've never heard that name before, it's because in the 50s they moved to Baltimore and became the Baltimore Orioles. And then he became the general manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. And as general manager, he had more say as to how the team was run. And for 20 years, he was the general manager. They won four World Series. And he brought a lot of things into baseball that were innovations that are still being used today. And then in 1942, he joined the Brooklyn Dodgers and had even more say because he was the general manager and the part owner. Because Branch Rickey was known to be pretty tight with a buck. <laughs> he saved a lot of money and he's able to buy part of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And so when he joined Brooklyn, he realized up to this point, he wasn't able to do a whole lot about that calling that he had. But now he had more influence, more power. And he was able to get one other minority owner on side with him about his plan, his plan to integrate Major League Baseball, to bring an African-American player into what was then the all-white Major Leagues. And he, he planned a meticulous plan. He began to send scouts out to all the, the Negro League teams to, to scout and find just the right person. He realized that he didn't want to find just the best player. He did, this person was going to need more than baseball talent. He was going to need character. He was going to need maturity in order to face the, the racism and the, the abuse that he was going to take. He wanted to find a player who was very dark-skinned. He didn't want to give the racists an opportunity to have a light-skinned player and say, oh, he's almost white, he can play. He wanted somebody that would really break down the barriers. The time was right, too. It was the end of World War II, and people were beginning to shake their heads in the States and say, well, African Americans went and fought for our country overseas, and yet when they come back here, they're met with all these restrictions and racism, and something just doesn't seem right. 
Another thing that, said, that showed the time was right was that this fellow named Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis died. Now, Kennesaw Mountain Landis was the commissioner of Major League Baseball. He took over in 1919 after the Black Sox scandal, which was when the Chicago White Sox threw the World Series and, and purposely lost because of, in order for gamblers to, to win money, and they were paid off for that. And they brought in Judge Landis because he was very hard-nosed and he was going to lay down the law. And no more of this fixing games and no more gambling. But he was also quite racist, and it was also he held in place this gentleman's agreement, no African-Americans in baseball. But he died. And a new commissioner took over named Happy Chandler, He's always happy. He was a senator, a U.S. senator, and he was from Kentucky. He was from the South. So they kind of assumed, well, maybe the, the same racist policy was going to continue. But he said, if, if, a, if a man can fight overseas for our country, there's no reason why he can't play baseball. And so things began to change. And Branch Rickey made a plan. He didn't dive into it foolhardy like that guy who tried to buy the Philadelphia Phillies and stalked the team with African Americans and then just and blurted it out. Branch Rickey was very careful who he told. And he had a plan all mapped out because he knew that, that if this plan failed, no one would try it again for another 20 years. And everyone would say, see, see, we're right in keeping baseball all white. And so he knew that he had to do this well. He had to have a plan. In Luke 14, 28 to 30, Jesus tells one of my favorite parables. And he talks about a man who wanted to build a tower but did not count the cost. And the man laid the foundation but could not finish it. And he got ridiculed by everyone else who saw it. said, ah, you couldn't follow through on it. And when I was in Montreal and I'm going to University of Montreal, my bus took me past a, a plot of land at the foot of the Jacques Cartier Bridge. And I watched as they constructed what looked like was going to be apartment buildings. And they dug out the, par the parking garage underneath. And they laid a cement slab over it. And then that was it. All the cranes disappeared, all the working dis workmen disappeared. And for two years, I drove by that spot on the bus, and all it was was a cement slab that just stayed there. Somebody had decided he wanted to build a building, but didn't count the cost, didn't figure out how to plan to, to do it properly, and it just, it just stayed there. Branch Rickey, like I said, he, he knew that failure would be huge, and so he counted the cost. He was willing to take on the burden of what he was taking on. It's easy to make commitments without thinking. Easy to say, easy to, easy to do it without thinking them through. And, I, and I've worked with volunteers for years and I have so much more appreciation for someone. If I ask them something, they'll say, let me think about it. They'll go away and two days later say no, rather than someone who says, yes, I'll do it, and then never does it. It's so important that we count the cost before we make a commitment and then jump in and do it. Christ calls us to carry the cross, to make sacrifices for him, to be obedient, but we're not to make that decision lightly. I don't do many altar calls here at church, but when I do, I make them as hard as possible. I tell them that this is what's going to, tell people this is what's going to happen when you want to follow Christ. It's not just he's going to make you happy. There's, there's a cost to it, and you have to decide, is he going to be your Lord? Is he going to be your king? Is he going to be your master? Because that's really what it's all about, that commitment. But when we do respond and make that commitment to, to, to follow him, he gives us the strength we need to be able to fulfill that commitment. So time came for, to put, for Branch Rickey to put his plan into motion. And he had narrowed down his search to, to a couple of players, but, but he was still unsure as to, as to how this was going to work. He knew that nobody in baseball would be happy. Um, none of the other 15 owners had this even remotely on their radar. They faced lots of opposition. So one of his, one of Brent Rickey's biographers tells the story of how he walked into a church in Brooklyn and asked to, to meet with the pastor and he sat down in the pastor's office and didn't say a thing. They sat there in silence and the pastor's like, okay, so what do you want? And then there was more silence and this pastor pulled out some work maybe and started doing some stuff. And Brent Rickey got up and paced the floor, looked out the window. It went on for an hour until finally he pounded the desk and said, that's it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to bring an African-American ball player into Major League Baseball. Sometimes we need those moments of just put, shutting everything out, and putting everything aside to, to really focus in on what God is calling us to do and connect with the Lord. Jesus, we're looking at the Gospel of Mark, and many times we see Jesus 
going and taking these times of prayer and going off alone, going away from the multitudes and going off in solitude and praying, especially before major events like choosing his disciples. And if he needed to, if the Son of God, if the person, the only person in history who was 100% God and 100% human, if he needed to go off by himself every once in a while and connect with his Father and find out what it is that God was calling him to do, how much more do we need to do that and take that time as well? So in August 1945, Branch Rickey invited Jackie Robinson to come into his office on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn to have a meeting. And Jackie Robinson had no clue. The rumor was that Branch Rickey was going to start a whole new Negro League and was trying to find new black ball players to play. But that wasn't what it was all about. And so he begins to set this plan in motion with this meeting. Now, Branch Rickey was 64 years old at this time. He was a year away from getting his pension. He had health issues. He had a bad heart. I think he'd already had one heart attack. He ended up, he passed away, I think, at the age of 83, having a heart attack in the middle of giving a speech. His wife begged him and pleaded with him, don't do this. This is going to stress you out so much, it'll be the end of you. But he still was ready to fulfill the call. He was ready to to act on this burden that he had had for 40 years. He was ready to do something about the passion that God had put into his heart. 64 years old, trying something new that no one had ever done before. You're never too old. You're never too old to fulfill the call of God on your life. You're never too old to step into the passion of what God is calling you to do. So, so far, I've only talked about the one half of this story of the two men. The other half is Jackie Robinson himself. He was born in 1919 in Cairo, Georgia. His father left the family when he was only six months old, leaving his mother and a number of other children besides Jackie. And his mother decided that the South at that time was no place for her family. And so she hopped on a train, boarded on a train with her kids and all what little resources she had, and headed to Pasadena, California. She was a very strong Christian woman, Mamie Robinson, loved the Lord. Now, life for African Americans in those days, especially in Georgia and in the South, was difficult. There were diff separate drinking fountains, whites only, blacks only. There were different blacks were not allowed to sit at the same lunch counters. Separate bathrooms. I was reading a book recently called Black Like Me. It was written in 19, by a man, a journalist in 1959, who disguised himself through, I don't know, through makeup and medication, changed his skin pigmentation to darker so he could live the life of an African American in Louisiana for about three or four weeks. And one of the things he said that you don't think of, you didn't think about as a white person is that if you had a job where you were on the road or you had to be out for a long period of time, you had to plan out how you were going to go to the bathroom because not every bathroom was going to allow you, not every place was going to allow you to use the washroom boggles the mind that this kind of stuff happened within our lifetime for some of us, within our parents' generation. Se pools were segregated. They had to sit at the back of the bus. There was separate seating in stadiums. When Billy Graham did his first crusade in Montgomery, Alabama, and he arrived at the stadium to find ropes separating where the African Americans could sit versus the whites, he personally went up in the stands and ripped the ropes apart. He did not want to preach to a segregated audience. Life was a little better in California. They didn't have the same rules and laws in place, so African Americans had more freedom, but there were still the same attitudes, and so there were still challenges. Um, Jackie Robinson's brother, Max, was a star track and field athlete, and he competed in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin and won a medal. I forget which color it was. I'm not sure if it was gold or I think it was in the long jump. And he came home, and a lot of the white athletes came home to a hero's welcome, and he came home to basically nothing, and the only job he could get was as a street sweeper. There were few job opportunities. Now, Jackie Robinson was able to go to college and university and was able to play in an in a integrated university setting where he played with white students, all these different sports. He starred in four different sports, and he got involved in church in Pasadena and was taken under the wing of a young pastor who had a real passion for working with young black men to just instill into them the gospel and, and leadership. And so 
um, Bat Robinson's biographer, Arnold Rampersand, talks about how Robinson accepted Christ as his savior as a teenager, and he eventually began to teach his own Sunday school class. He went into the army in World War II and was court-martialed because he got into an argument with a bus driver about because he didn't want to sit at the back of a bus. Uh, eventually, he was acquitted of the court-martial. They found that he was within his rights to, to refuse. After he came out of the army, he said, well, now I have to make a living. And like I said, there weren't a lot of opportunities for African-Americans there. And so he thought, I'm an athlete. I'll play sports. And even though baseball was his least favorite sport of the four, and probably the one he was the least good at, it was the one through which he could make money the, the, the best. And so he began to play for the Kansas City Monarchs, Monarchs of the Negro Leagues. And as he was playing ball, he was scouted, and he was called to re meet Branch Rickey in 1945, and he was offered a chance to play with the Montreal Royals in 1946. And he was astonished. He's like, you want me to play with the white baseball? And Branch Rickey said, yes. I think it's because the fact that he played, a key part of this story is, is Montreal, the Montreal Royals. I think it's always kind of appealed to me. When I worked in Montreal, I used to pass the block in East End Montreal, where the baseball stadium used to be, where Delormier Downs used to be. And there's a statue on the corner of Jackie Robinson, just honoring um, the fact that that's where he played baseball. There's a French high school that stands there now. And so the possibility would be that he would move up to the Major League Dodgers after that, but they take a lot of work. So this was, a, this was a significant meeting that they had together. And for two or three hours, Branch Rickey told Jackie Robinson what he would have to face. Branch Rickey wasn't given to profanity, but for the next two, three hours, he pretended he was the other ball players, and he swore at Jackie Robinson and called them all kinds of horrible names and said, what are you going to do if some player uh, slides in the base pass and tries to spike your legs? What, what are you going to do if a pitcher throws at your head? What are you going to do? Um, are you, you know, how are you going to respond to all of this? And he said to him, I want you to make me a promise that for three years, you will not fight back. No matter what anyone says or does to you, you will not fight back because the people who are against this, they won't see what was done to you. They'll only see the way you answer back. And Robinson, it is said that Robinson looked at him and said, well, are you looking for someone who doesn't have the guts to fight back? And Branch Rickey said, no, I'm looking for someone who has the guts not to fight back. In a movie called The Jackie Robinson Story where Robinson played himself, about four years after he started playing baseball. Um, the, the, this is a scene where Branch Rickey asks him, what happens if some player hauls off and just slaps you across the cheek? And Robinson looks at him and says, Mr. Rickey, I have two cheeks. Both of them understood the script Jesus teaching in scripture in Matthew 5. Someone slaps you on the one cheek, you give him the other. Someone steals your cloak, you give them a second cloak. Someone asks you to go a mile, you go to the second mile. And that's hard to understand, and it's hard to do. It's like we think, do we want to be doormats for other people? But God calls us to do that in order to accomplish his greater purpose. And Robinson and Ricky saw the big picture, that he would be blamed for fighting back, and that he needed to make this sacrifice, this sacrifice for the greater good, so that what the plan was could actually come to be. And we're called to lay down our rights for the kingdom of God. A lot of, we talk a lot about rights these days, and, and we hold on to our rights. I, I, I hold on to things sometimes, and I wonder, why am I, why am I fighting so much for that? It's not that big a deal. But God calls us to lay down our rights, to make the sacrifices in, for the greater good of the kingdom of God. One of Ricky's first questions to Robinson in this meeting was, have you got a girl? Because Ricky knew that Robinson would need support. And he had a girl. Her name was Rachel. They weren't married at that point. They got married shortly thereafter. Rachel Robinson is still alive. She's almost 100 years old. And if you know her story, she's just as strong as her husband. And a huge part. They were a team when they went through this together. And Ricky and Robinson were a team as well. Each needed the other in order to accomplish this feat. In 1962, when Jackie Robinson was elected to Baseball's Hall of Fame, he mentioned only three people by name, his mother, his wife Rachel, and Branch Rickey, who we always called Mr. Rickey. Each of them knew that they could not fulfill this plan. They could not fulfill this calling that they felt God had on their lives without the other. And Ecclesiastes 4 tells us that two are better than one. 
for they will have a good return for their work, and if one falls down, the other can help the other person up. Pity the person who falls and has no one to help them up. A cord of three strands, it says, is not easily broken. It's possible, but it's very unlikely to be a very strong Christian alone. It's very difficult to fulfill the calling of God's placed on our lives without the community around us. We need good Christian friends. We need, if God brings that person into our life, we need a spouse who, who shares our dreams, shares our calling, and our desire for God. And we need the support of, of mentors. We need to find people who we can look up to as a mentor, whether it's a dead mentor we read about or a live person that can be there for us and, and walk with us and, and show us the way to, to live this Christian life. Eventually, diabetes and ill health caught up with Jackie Robinson. By the time he retired from baseball at the age of 37, his hair was completely white. His, his last public appearance was in the 1972 World Series, where he was one of these you know, celebrities who come out to throw at the first pitch, and he was almost completely blind. He was walking with a cane, and he was only 52. He died a few weeks later at the age of 53, and some of his closest friends said it was baseball that killed him, the stress of having to go through all the racism that he did. There are many quotes you can find online attributed to Jackie Robinson, but there's one on his tombstone. It says, a life is important only in the impact that it has on other lives. A life is important only in the impact that it has on other lives. He felt called to a higher purpose. He was not placed on this earth randomly, and he knew it. He felt that God had put him in that time and place for a reason. It wasn't about himself. He went through great stresses and great sacrifices so that others, other generations could benefit. And as Christians, we're called to live from more than ourselves. Our lives are given to us in order to have an impact on other people, to influence other people, to influence society, to draw people into a relationship with God, their creator. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that we're called to do what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. It's not about getting our needs met. We don't become Christians and come to church to meet our needs, although God does that because he loves us. God will look after us. It's about us looking after others. It's about the impact that our lives can have on others in Jesus' name. i got to admit, I'm not as big a baseball fan as I used to be. Even, even ben, I don't have my team anymore. Montreal moved. Um, Bench players, players like Branch Rickey, who hardly played when he played, who hardly play at all, are making a million bucks. They're all millionaires. Or sometimes you see it's a simple game being played by children. But I still love reading about baseball history. And as I read this story, I see two men of faith who found their calling, who found their divine purpose in life. And they were willing to step out and take huge risks when no one else was willing to do it in order to do what was right in order to impact society. And God has placed a call on each and every one of our lives as well. And that calling is the same, to make an impact in the people around us for the kingdom of God, to make an impact in society for the kingdom of God, to make a difference. Now, we may never have a book written about us or a movie made about us, but we have each been called by Jesus and we've been placed, have had placed in our hearts and the spirits a burden and a passion that God gives us that just won't go away, just won't go away. And our, our thing to ask ourselves today is, are we going to respond finally to that thing that God is calling us to do that just won't go away? Will we give him our lives and make the sac sacrifices necessary to live out what God is calling us to do? Will we step out and do what's right and make a difference in this world, in Jesus' name. Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed. If you haven't already, take a moment and think of that thing. That thing that just won't go away. When I was in my 20s, I didn't go to Bible college to study for the ministry till I was 30, and I spent most of my 20s running away from that thing that was nagging at me that I needed to do till I finally gave in and went. 
which is what I, which is what I really wanted to do in the in the first place. It was what I was created for. You each have that burden, that passion on your heart. You feel it sometimes. And it just won't go away. It keeps coming back. And maybe God is telling you, you know what? Now is the time. Now is the place. This is the place. Things are coming together like they did for Branch Ricky and Jackie Robinson at that perfect time. But it still took two people to step out and do what they felt God was calling them to do. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. Maybe now is the time to step into that passion and that burden that God has given you to do that one thing that you were created for. Take a moment, just you and God. Talk this over. See what he has to say to your spirit. Make this message personal in your life. Father, thank you that we're not created at random, that we're not an accident, that you've created us with a plan and a purpose and a reason. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us ears to hear where you're leading us and where you're guiding us, that when opportunities are placed before us, when the time just seems right to do what it is you're leading us to do. Give us the courage, I pray, to step out and do it, even if no one else is doing it, even if we're going to get opposition and people are going to look down on us. I pray, Lord, that you'd give us the courage and strength to do what it is you're calling us to do. Thank you, Lord, that that no matter how old or how young we are, there is still a time and place for us to step into the passions and the, the burden and and the thing that you've given us and what you've created us for. I pray, Lord God, that even amidst the routine of every day, that you would help us to to see clearly your hand in, in putting us in different situations, in leading us and giving us a passion within our hearts for different situations. Give us the strength we need, Lord, to live out what we were created for. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.